Hello and welcome to the Grand Line Review, your source for everything One Piece. And today for the Devil Fruit Encyclopedia, we will be examining probably one of the most aesthetically off-putting fruits in the entire series, being the swampy glory that is the Numa Numa no Mi. The Numa Numa no Mi is a Logia type fruit that allows its user to conjure, manipulate and become swamp. Because yes, apparently in the One Piece world, swamp does classify as an individual element. And in this case, the fruit was consumed by wet haired Carabo, a rather slimy yet somewhat comical villain. And it was first displayed to us during the return to Sabadi arc. Now the fruit takes its name rather directly from the Japanese word for swamp or bog being Numa. Not to be confused with a piece of music primarily known as the Numa Numa song by Moldovan group Ozone, which is actually entitled Dragostad in Te. And the Numa in that song actually means don't want, which I think is actually in keeping with the theme of this fruit, as well as its user, because generally when Carabo appears in the series, I have a very don't want reaction. But getting back on track, in English this fruit translates simply as the Swamp Swamp fruit in both the Viz manga and Funimation subtitles. So let's discuss swamps because why not? Firstly, I think it's important to understand exactly what a swamp is, because if we go by what we see in the series, then we would be led to believe that a swamp is a simple collective of brown goop, which to be fair isn't too far off the mark. But in the real world, a swamp isn't exactly an element. In fact, it, it isn't at all. A swamp is more of a biome existence that represents a transition between land and water, thus often resulting in a forest wetland of general unpleasantry. But what the Numa Numa no Mi seems to represent is a mixture of mineral soils and water combined to make a giant muddy mess with surprisingly sticky and tangible results. And I mention the word tangible because when exploring Logias, it's always important to note that their abilities do make the user invulnerable to any form of physical damage that isn't infused with Haki, Sea Stone, or their counter element. However, this also generally comes with the caveat that the power of the Logia itself can't be used in a tangible way either. And there are of course exceptions to this and the Numa Numa Numi would appear to be one of them because apparently the combination of water and soil can form a compound viscous enough to handle objects or even bind giant mermaid princesses. And that's actually quite impressive for a Logia fruit and it opens up an entirely new avenue of use especially if the user is able to directly control the viscosity of the swamp, thus potentially resulting in an existence that could move seamlessly from an impervious water-like consistency to something more tangible and terrifying. And there is precedence within the Logia world for such an effect to take place. I mean, for example, take Smoker's Moku Moku no Mi, as it allows him to control how dense his smoke is, meaning that he can physically strike and even hold people with smoke alone. And I really don't see why the Numa Numa no Mi would be any different, provided that it was used in a competent manner. But speaking of the C word, I don't think we can go much further without bringing Karabo and his use of the fruit into this discussion. And look, Karabo is not necessarily, you know, a bad Devil Fruit user, but he certainly fits the definition of underwhelming. He's one of those users who gained a power and then overly relied on it, which was shown at the tail end of the Fishman Island arc, where he was convincingly defeated by Pecoms in a single blow. But that isn't to say that Karabo deserves no credit at all. In fact, he does sport quite a great use of the Numa Numa no Mi in regards to its seemingly infinite storage capacity. With this, Karabo could transport any number of objects or even living things within him, with one common example being a Gatling gun that he can just pull out of his body whenever a situation, you know, calls for a Gatling gun, which I don't know how often that happens in life, but it's possible. But the true power here is entirely within the storage rather than actually using items. I mean, in theory, Karabo could absorb and transport any number of traditionally difficult things to move with ease. Think things like poneglyphs. I mean, just imagine if Nico Robin had the Numa Numa no Mi, then she would just be able to absorb every poneglyph she came across and read them at her leisure rather than worrying about rubbings or quickly writing down their contents. But we can take this a massive step further as well and say that the Numa Numa no Mi user could transport massive objects like even the Noah, for example. And that's a pretty huge impact right there because at the moment, it would seem that the power of one of the ancient weapons, being Poseidon, is being planned to be used to summon Sea Kings simply for the purpose of transporting the Noah to the surface world. But meanwhile, over here, Karabo could just dom nom nom it and plonk it right up there. Possibly that is, because with this in mind, despite the fact that Karabo claims that the swamp is bottomless, you'd figure that there has to be some sort of limit as to what he can absorb, whether that's in regards to storage space or perhaps even how much he can extend his swamp. So in the case of the latter, he might only be able to absorb objects that he can fully cover with his maximum swampy surface area, which means that he may not be able to cover something like the Noah, because if this power were unlimited, then in theory, he could just absorb entire islands or perhaps even the planet itself. And while we're on this train of thought, it's time for awakening. 
things. So I have speculated at great length before in other videos that awakened Logias could result in the ability to completely change one's climate into the Logia element of choice. So in this case, I will first propose that with this fruit, as the user of the Numa Numa no Mi may be able to create some sort of eternal swampland, which, you know, that, that sounds fun. However, this fruit does also come with some bonus awakening ideas that spawn directly from its aforementioned potential limitations. So for example, if the user can only absorb things that they can cover, then awakening this fruit and being able to turn your entire environment into swamp would surely greatly increase your absorption ability by an order of magnitude. And then the user may actually be able to achieve something truly maddening by taking in an entire island, or perhaps even more. Some other miscellaneous things to consider when becoming a swamp human. One big weakness that should really be stressed in regards to this fruit has to do with the fact that its composition includes water. This factor rather unfortunately leaves the user of the Numa Numa Numi vulnerable to anyone in this world who has the capacity to manipulate water, which can be specifically found in the art of Fishman Karate. So if Garibo runs into an individual like Jinbei or really any proficient user of the art form, then it is effectively one of his natural counters. The Numa Numa no Mi is also one of the few Logia Devil Fruits that really lacks a solid degree of offensive power, because in the end, being slapped in the face with a piece of swamp is never going to be as effective as being struck by, say, magma, fire, ice, electricity, sand, or even just a regular good old punch. The Numa Numa no Mi user would have to have some incredible control of viscosity to push it to the point where it could be used as an effective blunt force weapon, and Karibo really hasn't demonstrated anything like that. So at the moment, it's more of a good tool to disarm and bind opponents rather than actually being able to fight them. Interestingly enough, when living beings are completely absorbed into the swampy body of this fruit's user, they are somehow able to continue living, despite the fact that in theory, they really should not be able to breathe or anything. And this only adds utility to the fruit because instead of simply being able to transport objects, you can now transport people or perhaps even an entire army with ease. Thus making the Numa Numa Numi an incredibly valuable tactical asset under the right circumstances in the same sort of way that Capone Gang Beige's fruit, the Shira Shira no Mi is. Meanwhile, there is definitely one other profound weakness to mention, which is that if the user of the Numa Numa Numi is caught in a confined space, then due to the lack of raw power that the fruit presents, they are essentially stuck and therefore easily imprisoned in objects like barrels, for example. So look, going into this edition of the Devil Fruit Encyclopedia, I was not particularly excited to be looking at the Numa Numa Numi, but upon reviewing it, I think it really is one of the more underrated fruits in the series, thanks largely in part to the general dislike and incompetence of its user. The great mistake to make with this fruit would be applying it exclusively to the realm of combat. That really is not where the Numa Numa Numi is at its most effective, but the capacity for potentially infinite storage, while well, that is an absolutely overpowered ability all on its own, even if you exclude the benefits of being a Logia class fruit, including that of general intangibility. And I can't believe I'm saying this, but if I was offered this fruit, I would 100% eat it on the spot because it would completely revolutionize the life of anybody who consumed it. Which I guess you can see in Karibo, for example, because if a being like him can even make semi-decent use of the fruit, then just imagine what the rest of us would be able to accomplish. And with that, we are going to commit the Numa Numa Numi to the Devil Fruit Encyclopedia. Next time on the Devil Fruit Encyclopedia, we are going to be taking a look at a rare example of a fishman who has eaten a devil fruit, and it's a surprisingly funky paramecia fruit at that, being Fanda Deccan's Matamato no Mi. If you enjoyed this video and the content this channel produces in general, then please do consider donating to the Grand Line Review Patreon, because the support of all of you amazing people is what continues to make this channel possible. And if you'd like to see more videos like this but applied to other anime manga series, then please do check out my second channel, New World Review, for all of your wider needs. And if you'd like to join the fun at any time, then please do head over to my Discord server, where a wide array of shenanigans takes place on a daily basis. And finally, please do comment with your thoughts on the Numa Numa no Mi. This has been the Grand Line Review, and I'll see you next time. For people claiming that Roger has a devil fruit, why is he wearing wood handcuffs at his execution? Uh -huh, right, so the argument here would be that if he was a devil fruit user, then he should be wearing sea stone cuffs, right? Well, there are a couple of answers to this, one of which would be the boring one that Oda just hadn't come up with sea stone at the inception of the series. But in general, I, I guess I do agree with your sentiment because I really hope that Roger was not a devil fruit user. And very specifically, I hope that he was not the user of the Gomu Gomu no Mi. I would love it if Roger's legend was just crafted by a particularly powerful regular 
world human. And while admittedly we don't know a lot about Roger's crew at the moment, none of the major members are currently identified as Devil Fruit users. And here specifically, we know for a fact that Shanks and Ray Lee aren't, because Shanks' status was confirmed in an article, and Ray Lee swam through the calm belt, so he can't be a fruit user. So I think it would be really cool if the Roger Pirates were a crew of entirely non-fruit users. Well, I guess with the exception of Buggy, who ate one accidentally. And yeah, there's also Douglas Bullet, who was a Devil Fruit user, but at the moment he is not canon, so meh. What made you start this channel despite knowing that there are tons of other channels about One Piece? Well, you're right. There are indeed a lot of other One Piece based channels on YouTube, but what made me want to do this is that I didn't really want to watch any of them. I was living in a weird place where One Piece was by far my biggest fandom, and I just did not want to engage in the YouTube landscape. Despite that being how I spent most of my spare time. No particular channel appealed to me, because at the time there were really only two types of videos. One would be a person in front of a face cam, taking an awfully long time to get to any given point, or a text to music music theory video, which were almost exclusively clickbait, and for the most part very poorly thought out. And I considered both of these broader types of videos a waste of my time, so I thought, screw it, I'll do it myself. And so I set out to create some short form videos, which were concise and digestible, but also trying to put more of a focus on One Piece itself, rather than me as a personality on camera. And I want to make it clear that I'm not taking shots at any other YouTubers here. They've all found their success, and dedicated audiences by doing what they do, so mad respect for the hustle. What they do just wasn't for me. And I think that I found an entire niche of One Piece fans who also wanted something different as well. 